Welcome to the Global Marketing Show, the podcast for all things international business. I'm your host, Wendy Pease, president of Rapport International and a translation expert. Come along with me today as we talk to an expert in the global marketing world about facing their biggest fears, hearing about mistakes they made or saw, discussing best practices, and sharing fun travel language and culture story. Welcome listeners to today's episode of the Global Marketing Show. As we're recording this episode, it's St. Patrick's Day that whether you celebrate, whether you're Irish or not, you can still celebrate it, especially here in the United States. We're having corned beef and cabbage tonight. Uh And as you know, we are sponsored by Rapport International, who puts out tidbits and lots of posts on social media with all sorts of language and cultural information. So we'll, do, we'll, we'll lead off with an Irish proverb today. I'm not sure how to speak Irish or Gaelic, but it's ni nert go cur So my pronunciation, I'm sure I badgered that. If you know how to say it, send me a recording of it so I know how to say it next year. But what it means is what's most important. It means there's no strength without unity. And I think that's such an appropriate one for the guests that we have today. I'd like to welcome Gregory Hess who has so much knowledge, we could spend hours talking to him, especially about what's going on right now. He's currently CEO and president of IES Abroad. It's a study abroad provider that changes lives. And he knows about education as he served as a college president. And in addition, he's a recovering economist and a dedicated Arsenal fan. Now, we're going to zero in on the recovering economist a lot today. So welcome, Gregory. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm really looking forward. I've really been looking forward to being here today. So thanks so much, Wendy. Yeah, and as we were just talking about before we started the recording is that we we were going to go one direction and talk about education and the international side of that and, you know, how IES changed its lives. But we got to talking about your background as an academic economist and you're well published in economics of conflicts. And so I'd love to start there. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you published as a professor and when when you were on the Federal Reserve Board? That's right. Well, you know, I've been fortunate throughout my career to have the opportunity to to do some some broad research in in an and and some focused research in within the areas of conflict, both in terms of the great spectrum of conflict that's out there, but also to be able to zero in on, on individual elements of conflict, everything from wars between countries, wars within countries, you know, things like civil wars and revolutions, and also to look at issues of transnational terrorism, which are oftentimes, you know, conflict with non-nation state uh, actors and and you know, we've been able to trace a lot of its its connections to economic the, the economics of the situation, but also its impact on the economics of the situation. I've been fortunate to do that throughout my career. So to begin with, the first one we looked at was you know how how the economics of a country could influence the timing of of conflict, and what we find a kind of broad historical evidence that oftentimes wars happen when recessions happen that and we think that's that's related to you know leaders trying to you know divert attention from their current economic situation to get people thinking about their abilities in other areas if they're not very good at handling the economy sometimes they might be pretty good at handling conflict and conflicts pervasive so you you always want people who can handle conflict and, and that's a paper we published in, in the mid-90s that they got some attention, particularly when we applied to the United States. So that, that, that was a, a key article we did. We've also found this uh, to, to be kind of a more comprehensive overall. So I think a lot of the early work we did was to try to trace what, what caused war. And I suppose maybe later on uh, in my career with several co-authors, we've looked at you know, the economic impact uh, that war has on countries and the impact that it has on, on individual lives. Chicken and the egg keeps right. coming to mind here yeah. because you have people who are in a recession, so they're unhappy, but starting a war to get their mind off of it also stimulates yeah. 
the economy. Yeah, well, I, I, I tend to think that uh, I, 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 I tend to find a little bit less evidence for the kind of the stimulative effect of, of those wars, because oftentimes those are in, you know, the stimulative effects are mostly in terms of government spending and things that people can't consume on, on a regular basis. It might generate some income from them, but doesn't really benefit their lives on a direct basis. So we, we, we tend to find evidence that war always makes people worse off. The question is yeah. that sometimes you need people who are, who are good at handling those really difficult situations. So in some ways, starting a conflict allows people to, particularly small ones, and not necessarily big ones, but sometimes we find that diverting their attention to smaller conflicts and demonstrating their ability to handle conflict is a good signal to, you know, to, to, to members of a society. And so since you always know a conflict's going to be out there, you always want somebody, even if they're maybe not great at handling, you know, the economy, maybe they're a little bit better at handling their national security affairs. And as you know, national security affairs are, are critical to to, to every country throughout the world. Okay, so as we're recording this on March 17th, 2022, yeah. we all know that there's a major event going on in the world, yeah. and that's Russia's right. invaded Ukraine. Right. And so I'm so curious on your take on this, because it's just heartbreak breaking. Yeah. I just, well, I watch that. And I don't understand because we've just had a major pandemic go through here. And it seemed like Russia handled it okay relative to some of the countries. Why, you know, and then he, Putin waited until the end of the Olympics to do this. So give me your take on from what did you find in your research to what's going on there? Yeah, well, I, I have, haven't worked, you know, d directly in terms of thinking through the, you know, all, all of the minutia of the causation of the situation. But if I kind of look back at the broad sweep of the research that I've been able to work on throughout my career, there, there are certainly very egocentric nation, you know, nation building desires in, in Mr. Putin. And what that does is that it, it means that he sees a lot of, you know, rents, a lot of benefits, a lot of ego associated with the creation of what used to be in terms of a bigger, a broader sphere of influence for his country. And you know, that those 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 benefits are not widespread. They don't unnecessarily benefit the average person in his country, but they certainly affect him positively and affect his inner circle uh, quite positively. This is their uh, vision for their country. And as part of that, they were willing to minimize the impact this, you know, the impact this will have on the average citizens of Russia, which will be huge losers from this conflict. They obviously didn't uh, take into account much of what's happening to the rest of the world, including Ukraine. They didn't mind inflicting uh, severe damage on the rest of the world and, and the Ukraine. And he's willing to to think that the, those rents that he gets, that, that, that ego that he gets, that nation building that he wants to see happen with him and his insiders outweighs all the other consequences. There, there will be severe negative economic consequences for the average Russian. I don't have to tell people there will be huge losses in, in the Ukraine. And what I think he probably has not not fully considered is the ricochet effect this has on instability both within his country and in uh, and in neighboring countries. So may maybe that's kind of the first point I'd like to say. That, that that's the big first point. The, the second big point I'd like to say is that look, you know, ex external war is very costly, but it, it it pales in comparison to the to the ricochet effect of um, and in some I'll, I'll even use a semi-loaded uh, statement here. Uh, the domino effect this has on internal conflict and, and, and civil strife within both his country and in, and in other neighboring countries. So that, that will also weigh heavily um, on the region. And I think this is going to, the quicker we can ring fence this issue, the quicker we can limit the effects of this external conflict, that the better the world will be and the better that the, the citizens of all countries will be. Okay, so we started out talking, well, first I have to point out that I called sure. him Putin. You were very respectful and called him Mr. Putin. And so I, 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 I don't think I can quite, I can't quite get there to call That's him okay. Mr. or any honorary. So <laughs> okay. uh, we'll, we'll just go with that. But then going on, you, we, we started out talking about how conflict can start during a recession. And so you're, mm -hmm. this, this was not recession driven. This was re really egocentric driven mm -hmm. is what you're saying yeah. or saying. I, 
Yeah, to, to my mind, you know, this was just much more, you know, it, it was it was a determination that, you know, that that the people that support him, which, you know, is, is a reasonably limited limited circle, that they would be huge beneficiaries in terms of this of this broadening of, of their, their their view of, of what the, the nation of Russia has been and, and could be. You know, I, I don't think there were any strong economic incentives for him to start it. He certainly has secured a strong position within his country. But uh, the fact is that he has a vision he believes he benefits from. He somehow believes the rest of his country benefits from. But I think the history will show that c- countries that invade very seldomly benefit from creating large external conflict in other countries. About that, like the history and what we can project mm-hmm. going forward, you mm-hmm. know, God willing and all the hope in the world to get this over with quickly, because it's just horrible you know so assume i I don't know the longer it goes the worse economic it's going to have but talk to me about the history of countries that have invaded and what the economic effects are because it's more than the sanctions we're putting on sanctions are only like the first level right yeah sanctions the first level and then they have to think of just about Winning the war is not the same thing as securing the peace. That the instability within the Ukraine in 2014, when Russia moved into into certain parts of Ukraine, they probably had a stronger presence of pro-Russian people that that might have kind of limited some of the collateral damage that could happen from it. But it's clear from the resistance that that the rest of Ukraine is now is 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 not going to go down easily in in this. Fight and you know a lot of countries been able to occupy other countries for a while, but there there is always an underground resistance that could not only affect what happens in their ability to manage Ukraine, but also maybe the ability to manage other parts of Russia. I mean, these you, you don't control. You know, once the genie's out of the bottle, it's very hard to control how the how how people resist. It could be within the Ukraine, could be other parts of uh, Russia. I mean, it's it, it's going to have, it, it's going to be a very difficult situation for them for uh, the, the time being, get, given the current path that they're on. Okay. So can you take me back through history mm-hmm. and, you know, pick an mm-hmm. instance where there was a conflict mm-hmm. between countries like that and the ongoing economic constraints that they had or issues? Well, you know, we can just think about some of the instances the U.S. has gotten into over the past um, 20 years or so or, or more in response to 9-11. I mean, those are pretty impressive ones where, you know, we went to, there, there was a, a presumed and, and perhaps a very strong, I, I, I won't comment on that more generally, that there was a presumed strong national interest in moving into Afghanistan, sources of where 9-11, you know, had a foothold based on the intelligence at the time. The same with not not just um, Afghanistan, but also potentially Iraq. And obviously that, that that's not a, the History there is not on a straight line. You know that, that that's kind of a circuitous route to get there, both at the time and certainly in retrospect. We went into a country to create stability, to create a stronger economic environment. Really, didn't take into account as much of the how some of the local neighbors might act in response, either to be rivals or to be supportive. In Afghanistan, you can think about Pakistan. With regard to Iraq, you might think of Iran. You know, a lot more things happened than, than we ever expected. We spent a lot of time in there. We accomplished uh, a number of our goals. I'm not sure the U.S., you know, ever, you know, we spent trillions of dollars on that in, in, in that conflict. You no, know, I'm not sure how the benefits weighed out there. Obviously, Afghanistan and Iraq have had their own dislocation and are recovering to some extent. Maybe that's, you know, but, you know, th- there, was, there was a lot of stuff going on for 20 years that, you know, in response to those, to those decisions. That, that's the kind of tales that these types of conflict have. So I'm going to push and probably ask some naive questions just to get the conversation going. So the U.S. went in there and spent trillions of dollars, yet our economy continued to grow. So Mm -hmm. as the the country that invaded, if I, you know, keeping in the back of my mind, we're talking about Russia and the Ukraine. We continued to grow, whereas Afghan, Iran, Iraq, you know, Pakistan, like they may have suffered more 
economic yeah. consequences, yeah. Yeah. Well, which would US, be the Ukrainian in the back of mind situation. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, you know, we haven't quite paid the bills for those conflicts. You know, we've we debt financed a lot of them. So we haven't quite financed all the pieces of it. Yes, the economy it did grow probably for a whole host of, of other reasons. We had, you know, my, my guess is that the economies probably would have grown even faster should we not have gotten into those very long-term conflicts. And as you know, we have a lot of you know, servicemen and women who suffered um, greatly, have not been able to fully you know, bring themselves back into the lives they'd hoped they'd have or, or the workforce. And, and, and there's a liability, you know, a financial liability uh, there as well as we continue to help them in their, in, in their recovery through you know, veterans assistance and, and through you know, medical care. So it has, you know, the, the overall economy has grown, the, probably the, but not for everyone. Okay. That's a yeah. good way of looking at it. It's not that it's sure. going to tank your economy, but it's going to hold you back. And there's certainly all those mm-hmm. costs, let alone the people that have suffered. It's, yeah. It has a huge, a huge uh, personal cost. That, that, that being said, you know, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not Pollyanna here. I mean, I recognize, you know, as, as hopefully I said from the beginning, you know, wars are constant throughout history. You know, you, you do need a strong national defense. There, there are conflicts that are unavoidable. You know, it's not really, you know, I, I don't always know which ones are avoidable, and I don't know which ones are unavoidable. All I know is that there are probably too many of them that, that happen at certain times for them to be just completely all unavoidable conflicts. And sometimes a country start them to divert attention, and, and that just creates a, a ripple effect that, that, that doesn't dampen down for, for quite a while. And I think anytime we've seen big conflicts, un, unless, you know, we've had some big world wars that have finally calmed things down, you know, but not without hu- huge loss of life and huge costs and sacrifice. So war is, is a bad thing, even if, it, even if it is part of our lives. Right. So listening to that, you're kind of saying mm-hmm. war is unavoidable. There, there's a part of it that is, you know, it's, it's probably a smaller part. And I, th- you know, I think some of the, the research we've also done suggests that there are some ways to make um, war um, less frequent and reduce its frequency such that it becomes much, you know, the unavoidable piece of it does decline a bit. There's a paper we wrote published in the journal Political Economy a number of years ago, based on a conjecture by Immanuel Kant, which is if the world were more democratic, if the world were just peaceful and 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 combined with with what we call kind of purely democratic countries, would there ever be war? And and that's a conjecture that Immanuel Kant wrote about many years ago in a book called The Perpetual Peace. And in that book, he conjectures that if the world were just democracies, there'd be no war. And we have strong leanings towards there. We're still a little skeptical that 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 the democracy is, is um, definitely part of the cure. It may not be the whole cure, but it's definitely part of the cure. And the way we think about democracies, uh, democracies should be led by leaders who care about the the welfare of the common person. They can't distinguish their own kind of ego benefit. You know, they they're, they're much better at diminishing their ego and their view of the nation and spend much more time thinking about the welfare of the common person. And, and you'll find uh, rich in the political science literature that, you know, evidence that broadly speaking, countries that uh, are democratic are extremely, I mean, so some say it's never happened. I'll say it's extremely infrequent that they ever go to war. Pure, purely democratic countries. Okay. Uh, now I majored in uh, undergrad in foreign uh, service and international politics. Okay. So did a lot of this. And I, you know, I can remember having very mixed feelings. Like I am completely against war. I see no reason yes. for it. Let's just come to the table, talk it out. And yeah, we're not going to like it, it. And yet on the other hand, taking a course on the UN, I could yeah. see that people bring such different backgrounds in. It's hard to have right. a conversation when you're, you're, view on the world is so different. Right. But if you can unite around uh, democracy, yeah. that's mm-hmm. good to know. And, you know, and to, you know, and, and democracy brings with it a set of you know, norms and institutions. The institutions may differ across democracies, but oftentimes mm-hmm. the norms don't. But usually, you know, they are 
negotiation, compromise-based, some of the things you'll find right now that, that are <laughs> in less supply around the world. You know, compromise is not considered a great word right now, both within countries and across countries. And but 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 that's the basis of ultimately of 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 democracy trying to think through how, you know, majority groups maintain the support of non-majority groups, however you want to slice it, in order to provide the common good. You know, and that's something that we still continue to seek in, in each and every country and to bring those norms across the world, we think ultimately supports peace. Okay, so that that's going to switch us over now to the students and teaching right. and working mm -hmm. together and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So how does IES change lives mm -hmm. and help students grow? Well, you know, one of the kind of the, the, the fundamental you know, basics of what we do at IES abroad in terms of study abroad is to make sure that students have a deeply intercultural experience and that they get an exceptional academic experience as, as part of that. We think that by immersing students in another culture, learning how to navigate their their commuting, their you know everything, the small things, buying groceries, having a place to stay, standing in line, you know, all, all the things that are associated with working and living in in a place that's unfamiliar, does build both habits and also understanding of kind of what the other means, you know, and and how other people live and. We think that that is a huge piece of, of, of building, you know, understanding both for themselves, for people around the world, but also to bring that understanding back to their home country, primarily the United States when, you know, for our students, but, but not exclusively, but bring it back to their home country in order to um, better understand themselves. And we think that's, that that is a truly life-changing experience, both in terms of when they see new things, but as they realize they can handle new things. So we think that's also probably one of the other gifts we bring them not just intercultural understanding, but that understanding about how to appropriately navigate ambiguity. And we think intercultural understanding and, you know, ability to handle ambiguity are life-changing skills that will serve them uh, deep into their lives. Deep into oh, their that lives. is so into my core. I love hearing you say that. I've taken my kids on international travel every year, except during COVID, <laughs> to make them understand that. Mm -hmm. So your students, a lot of them, I'm assuming, have never been out of the United States when they're going. Yeah, yeah no, a fair number. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've been once abroad. Oftentimes, they have not spent much time abroad. They certainly haven't spent a month or a semester or even a year abroad. And, you know, uh, we find ways to get them ensconced in life now. You know, they're they're confronted immediately with the fact that university life and academic life abroad is a little different. So there's not a dorm a half a mile away. There's sometimes they have to commute. You know, they have to go to the grocery store uh, more frequently. They, they're with a homestay family, so they get to be, and many of them are in with homestay family, so they get to be part of, you know, build out a second family uh, for themselves that can be a source of uh, strength and comfort. So it, it, it does, it, it is a, a super meaningful experience to them. As you know, many young people, every young person who has a phone, which is basically every young person, considers themselves to be a filmmaker, social media person. We, we now run this great film festival for students who build who build out films of their experience. And we have a film contest for them. So we have all sorts of ways to for them to not only you know gain gain their experience, but also to share their experience, not, not just with their own accounts, but also to try to share that more holistically. So it is a life-changing experience for them. And even though they may not have been abroad, you know, maybe never or maybe more than once before in their lives. I think that's so fantastic because that experience there will help them get into international business or development yeah. or, or anything. And I see so many adults that are afraid of it. So, so speaking of fears, what are some sure. of the fears your students have or funny experiences from the start that they've run into? Let's start with fears. Oh, you know, the, you know I, I think it's always fears of the unknown. I, I think primarily they're, they're kind of sometimes can be worried about the academic experience. What's it going to be like in a completely different environment? These are juniors who, you know, as freshmen got lots of intel about which courses to take and how to manage the situation. And, 
you know, all, all the good things about, you know, getting and starting that college experience. And they, you now they, they got to reshuffle the deck. Now they don't quite know, you know, how do I get my books? Where do I go? You know, all, all these things, you know, as part of their academic life, which is, you know, one of the, which is, I remind them is the primary reason they're there to be students. But of course, you know, they're often about trying to have some fun. They've also got to make new friends. So, you know, I think those are the two things that they worry about, you know, the classroom and you want to make new friends. And the answer is, you know, we, you know, uh, we, we know how to get them and familiarize themselves with the academic experience, like in seconds. And yes, there are a lot of people just like them with the same kinds of fears. And that's a great initial bonding experience. We make sure they, that they get those quick bonding um, experiences out of the way. Now, one of the things that the, the newest fear we've picked up is sometimes parents. This is not an unusual thing in higher education. Parents are much more involved in their kids' lives. And, you know, sometimes they, they project um, a, a little bit as well. As you know, there's always this view that there are helicopter parents out there. I'll, I'll let you know that the most frequent used term now, certainly from my time as college president, is I think it's now called the curling parent, which means that there's usually one parent yelling instructions and another parent moving their feet and sweeping the room quickly, trying to make sure that the stone, think of the, the student as their stone, lands perfectly where it's supposed to be. So we do, we have to, like all other, like people starting with kindergarten and actually starting preschool and nursery school all the way through the pipeline. It's, it's hit the college experience and the study abroad experience that, that parents you know, are, are starting to get a little bit more involved. And we, we have a ways of working with that. Oftentimes it's the better people like visiting their kids when they're studying abroad, but you know, we're doing our best to make sure that we can form the parents in a pretty efficient way so that their student gets the best experience out of IES abroad. Now, I laugh. I I would love to be a sweeping parent or a helicopter (laughs) parent just because I love my kids and I want to know what they're doing. But boy, I've got a high school senior and he wants me nowhere. He just keeps setting those boundaries. (laughs) I'm like, all right, go for it. That is a useful life skill. Not a useful yeah. life skill, you know, um, I, <laughs> and my daughters uh, did, did the same thing. And, and, you know, oftentimes there are those family dynamics and we always try to get those families to work that out themselves. Uh, we're happy to be supportive, but we, we, yeah. we want them to work it out together. And sometimes right. they're not, oh, yeah. students and, and parents are not on the same page and, and, and that's true throughout, you know, the whole educational experience. So. Uh, yeah, we well, do. we're on we, the same page. I just would have good. him do it earlier and I would be more involved. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trusting he's going to get it done because I know good. he has goals. <laughs> good. Oh, good, good, good for your son. Good for your okay, son. so they have fears. Now, what countries do your students go to? Oh, my goodness gracious. So we're in about 20 different countries, I think. And that includes some of the, well, mo- all the major countries in, in Western Europe. So, or almost all the major countries in Western Europe. So Spain, Italy, France, uh, England, Austria, Germany. I know I'm missing some and I'll hear about it later. But, you know, we, we tend to have a strong presence in, 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 in Europe, per se. We have a presence in uh, throughout Asia, both in uh, China uh, and Japan. Obviously, those have been, have a kind of longer tails in terms of the COVID experience that we're still trying to get those centers open and making sure we can get visas for students and all the like. And, and that's shared throughout the study abroad. Obviously, we, we also have a presence in, in Central and South America, everything from Ecuador, Chile, uh, Barcelona, and uh, New Zealand, and in the other hemisphere, we've got Australia, New Zealand, and then in Morocco as well. So we do have an ex- experience for students there in Cape Town, oh, in Southern Africa as well. So we have, a, we, we have a, a, a pretty nice footprint in terms of where we send students at U.S. institutions to. I- IS Abroad is also unique in that we also merged a number of years back with um, a company, and it's part of our organization now called the Study Abroad Foundation, SAF. And SAF actually brings students from other parts of the world and brings them to study abroad, both in the U.S. but in other countries as well. So we're trying to provide more of an international platform for students to study abroad. Not non-trivial, since every country has their own restrictions. And it, this is not, as an economist, I'd say this is not like the market for apples. You know, there's not like a uh, law of one price and seamless trade and all those other pieces. But the Study Abroad Foundation supports students in China, Japan, and Korea to study abroad, both in the U.S. and in other countries around the world. And so we have both students you know, from the U.S. going out, but we're also bringing students from around the world into the U.S. and other parts of the country and, and, and other countries as well. 
All right, this is fascinating. So you've got kids coming in with the fear of unknown about academics. So already yeah. they have that fear going into college. Now yeah. they're going off to one of the many kind of, I mean, I'm just looking That's to right. think of Morocco or sure. China or Japan. What language skills do they have to have to go? Well, it, it does vary uh, in, in particular in some of them, you know, in some cases, there will be opportunities in foreign countries for them to take courses in English. Oftentimes, they can do that if they're comfortable enough. They can work with a local university to also take some classes or else they can take classes in a foreign language in our centers as well. So they, they do have a range of opportunities. There are some centers that really specialize in hone in on just pure language, you know, on a, on, on a stricter version of language development. And we have a center in France and Nantes where, you know, it's the expectation that it's all in French from day one and everything you do is in French. And we do, we have somewhere in Spain as well in Sevilla. And obviously in other countries, we have to make adjustments for a student's ability. And, uh, you know, the fact that not every university has students prepared to the level uh, that, that we need. But, you know, language development and that is 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 one of the, the things that we, we require students to get in, in our country. So for example, when students go to, to Milan, which is one of our biggest centers, they do take a course in introduction to Italian, e even though they may be taking courses in English at our centers, they will be taking Italian at the same time. Uh, Italian's a little harder language to get at many US universities. So it's just not as, it's not as frequently taught, even though it's you know, you know, a, a pretty standard language around, you know, th throughout Europe. So in any case, we have a, a range of opportunities and a range of menu. We have a, a pretty good menu for students. Okay, so it, you know, when students are coming into the United States, they have to take the TOEFL test to make sure they know English yes. well enough. Right. But if you're an American student and you want to go to any of those countries, yes. you can practically go to any if you have no language background. Yeah, that, that, that won't be true for every center that we have, but there will be options for students if, if English is, is, is the primary and perhaps only language that they know. Obviously, places like New Zealand and Australia would be uh, kind of you know, e easy opportunities for them as well. Unfortunately, as you know, this semester, well, even for us right now, Australia and New Zealand are not um, available for study abroad just because of you know the COVID and visa restrictions and uh, visa wait times, or we expect they'll be open this summer and 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 thereafter as as COVID. I'm presuming recedes. I think that's all the all the good messages that we've received right now is that COVID continues to be you know an issue, but a very manageable issue throughout our centers that that we operate. Right, right. Now I am kind of laughing as an expert in the language industry. Yeah. We do translation from yeah. U.S. English into U.K., vice versa, yeah. and Australia. And so you say it's easy. I'd have to say it's easier. Yeah. Well, you can get yourself <laughs> in trouble. I've been fortunate in my career. I, I've taught, you know, and been able to work both in the U.S. and the U.K. I've taught undergrads, PhDs, MBAs in in two different countries. And yes, you know, you, you've got to be careful, certainly with language, but also in you know many cultural assumptions even in countries that I think I think they share but are divided by a common language I think is the expression that's used in the UK. Yes, yes, yes. I've absolutely seen that. It's true. Yeah. Can you talk about a success story of somebody who went on the on one of the exchanges, did a study abroad, and then maybe came back and got into business or you know leveraged that experience in the country that they went to? Well, I'll probably, you know, I'll, I'll cherry pick a little bit, you know, but I had business so much, but somebody who's had a huge impact in her young life is, is the young woman who was the poet laureate for, for Joe Biden's presidential inauguration, Amanda Gorman. Amanda was a student at our IES and actually worked on one of her uh, children's books when she was on IES, a good program, and has been generous in her thanks to a broad faculty for supporting her interest in, in building out those capacities. She did a little short little ditty for us. This is before, you know, before she became, before people knew she was the rock star that we knew she was, she did a little video for us, thanking her and talking about what a great experience she had IS abroad, particularly since, and, and you can watch the video, she, she had an appendectomy, I think, which had delayed her, or she had a medical issue that delayed her getting into her broad experience for a couple of weeks. So, you know, they got, they caught her up and helped work on her book. And she's been exceptionally generous in her gratitude for 
Ayas Abroad. And, you know, obviously she's a, a young person with just magnificent, you know, ability to capture the, the cultural pulse and to project it in, um, in you know, in, in mellifluous ways. And I, I think I... I, I think we probably helped her a little bit, but I, I don't think anything was going to stop her. And 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 fortunately, you know, we we were just one of the organizations that were that, that were blessed by having her as a student. So uh, I think Amanda Gorman's probably probably the easiest one for me to think of right now. I, I'm sure on the way she'll pick up some some business uh, acumen. I think she's doing pretty well right now. So, so I think she's handling her her affairs pretty nicely. Good. And you said she picked up the the cultural pulse. Did she write her books about being in Madrid or what was the cultural I, I, I don't, pulse? I don't believe so. But, you know, she, you know, she just has that, you know, I, I know she worked on her, or one of her books, her children's books. It's, I think, boy, I wish I could remember the name of it. Something like, it's about, gosh, I've got two of the three words in, right in my head. I, I could Google it in a second, but she, she worked on one of her books when she was there, one of her children's books. But obviously she hasn't, understanding of of culture and we think an experience like IES where we emphasize intercultural experiences is you know pro- probably resonated and and you know I'm not I, I for for most students it amplifies their ability to to have to 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 be a, a cultural observer and to be a kind of a cultural contributor and and hopefully we we guided her, we we helped her along that path Okay. Yeah. I Googled while you were talking, change sings a children's change anthem, it. and then the hill we climb That's right. book of poems sure. and then the inaugural poem for the country, the hill we climb. Yeah. So That's we'll right. put a link to that in the show notes. Right. Okay. She, there yeah. The, the sixth and youngest poet at the age of 22 to deliver poetry reading at the presidential inauguration. That's me. Mm-hmm. That's really great. So she is a huge success. How about other, are there other students that went back to live? I mean, it's kind of hard because they come in and do the, do the program. So you probably don't know if they're, after they graduate, the you work know, we, that they we, do, we, we, do they go we live. We do our best to keep track. I mean, and oftentimes they, they can find us. There's, you know, a, a woman, you know, I, I've talked to a couple of times and been fortunate enough to meet. She's, you know, she's recently retired and she was in a program with us in in Aberdeen, which is a program we no longer run. And she talks about her year long experience there. She really had never thought about a world where she could have an international business experience until she spent a year in Aberdeen and realized that there was a great big world out there. And she spent probably her career probably on three or four I think at least three different continents, probably the super majority of her life in financial positions, you know, high level financial positions. And as a woman, you know, that in, at, at that time in, in our history, that, that was pretty, you know, she, she was ahead of her time. She was on the vanguard of finding ways to open up doors for, for other women. And I, I hear this time and time again, you know, particularly, um, in certain cases, and particularly in this case of, of this this one alum who just said that, look, I would have never thought in the world I could have had a, a career around the world, and she did, and that she's extremely uh, grateful to Ayas Abroad for doing that. But 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 I will say you are right. You know, people when they do study abroad are usually only first semester, so we don't quite have as much. You know, we aren't as quite as sticky on them as as like when they're undergraduate institution. We don't have a football team or a basketball team or somebody to cheer about. Although I do I do remind people our our football team is undefeated. You know, we've never lost, so we haven't won either. But you know, we'll. We'll, we'll we'll take whatever we can get, but but the fact is, you know, there are people who do, you know, who, who in, in particularly business and international careers to make a difference. The other thing we're doing, and, and you mentioned it earlier about how important inter study abroad experiences for students when when they go in the job market. I I've always felt that when young people, you know, regardless of their majors, you know, you, you can find your passion. But what you really need to do is find some skills and and find some experiences, regardless of your major. And, you know, being being a good writer is a great skill. Having great experiences like studying abroad you now is a great way to talk about life and talk about uh, your adaptability and talk about your your ethic in a job interview. And one of the ways we continue to amplify that is just through our, not only do we have a study abroad program, but we also have a program that helps place students in internships, either part-time or full-time as part of their study abroad experience. And we work very closely because we have centers 
we have 30, you know, over 30 centers around the world. We, we, we work with our, you know, our local communities to find small to medium sized businesses that would be interested in having, you know, U.S. students help them in, you know, in developing their skill sets. And it's a very popular program. We're extremely good at it. It comes with curricular piece. We ask them to be reflective about it to, 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 and, and find ways to, to build out their skill sets part of it. But saying that, you know, you helped, you know, work with a firm in Italy as they were trying to develop and trying to help. In, in fact, one, one case of a student who actually had gone to the same high school I did in San Francisco, I met with a great Santa Clara student when I was in Milan who'd gone to the same high school I did in San Francisco, which is where I grew up. He was telling me that he was working for uh, a small company in Italy that helps Italian companies break into the U.S. market. And he was talking about how much this made an impact in his life and, and uh, you know, how he could use this experience when he got back uh, to the U.S. to uh, further his, his uh, business desires, so his career desires. So we, we do make uh, those kinds of connections uh, for students all around the world. That's fantastic. Now, I just earlier this week attended yeah. the conference. Was, it was the uh, State International Development Organization. So it's all the tr state trade directors yeah. that come in to gather and share best practices because they offer free consulting to companies that want to mm -hmm. export and yeah. they even offer grants. And I know some of them have an internship program. Do you place any interns in the United States or they're all international? You know, for a time, we've actually were working towards, you know, for having international students outside the U.S. come in to do internships in the U.S. So we do we do have some of that. And we've we for a while, and this is pre pandemic, we had we were doing that both in New York and in uh, Chicago. And that was the, the destination places for students from outside the U.S. to come into the U.S. as part of their as, as part of their experience. And obviously, the pandemic's kind of put a bit of a crunch yeah. on that one. But it is something that we're looking to revive as, as the world um, goes forward. And, and I think our, our goal now is to continue that and to continue not only to make it a, you know, a great experience, but also to continue to build out the skill development piece and find ways for them to connect those experiences so they can, you know, once again, you know, kind, kind of, you know, cr cr cross fertilize their experiences with, with other people of, of, uh, of, of their generation. So to try to pull these interns together to, 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 to cross fertilize what they've learned and to, so that they all can more, more generously benefit from each individual experience. Oh, I think it's fantastic. And, and each of the states have international offices too. So right. placing the students in internships at some of those lo local offices sure. might be a yeah. good idea. So yeah, that sounds wonderful. That's yeah, wonderful. yeah. Okay. So if anybody listening has any students that are interested in doing this, you can certainly reach out. We'll get Gregory's contact information on the show notes and also at the end. So right. now let's, you know, this is also uh, a show to help organizations with how they do their international work. You're yeah. working with people all over the United States. How do you handle your translation and interpretation? Uh, well, in, in certain languages, you know, we uh, do have centers abroad who can do some of the work for us. So if we have uh, material in, you know, in a certain foreign language where we have a center, we have a natural kind of go-to place to get things started. We do some of it abroad and we do some of it locally. You know, a, a lot of the things I've learned about moving from being a college president in the U.S. to being uh, the president CEO of a uh, international kind of organization is that we have a lot of lot a lot of contracts and a lot of legal insights from 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 each of our countries, which means and oftentimes when legal materials come to me, I, I get two versions of it. I see it in the original language and I see it in translation language, and of course we have to look pretty carefully at that that legal language. So. For, for better or for worse, a lot of the translated materials I see are side by side from, from, from law firms uh, or from our legal consultants around the world. And, uh, you know, that, that's something I just have, to, just have to get used to. So, but, you know, all our center directors around the world, their, their English is, you know, I would say, you know, spectacular. You, you wouldn't, you know, it, it's spectacular. So we usually have most of our international communications in English. That's, that's the language of the organization. But if we have to switch languages there, people in there who can do it. They haven't had to translate for me directly, but usually I, if things do have to get translated, oftentimes it's in, it's a more official capacity. And what about when you're placing students at small and mid-sized businesses? 
Yeah. Well, I, oftentimes the, those. So, so in in the in the cities where we do this, you know, it's done by the the local centers. The local centers, you know, they're all they all speak the uh, the local language. So if if it's in say Milan or Vienna, the, there's a person who helps work directly with uh, community members, and they, you know, it's all done. If, it, if it's in Vienna, it's in German, it's in Milan, it's in Italian, and they work directly with them. They might have an English ability that's, you know, at the firms that's that's good. Obviously, if they're trying to help Italian, in the example of the Italian firm that's trying to help businesses come to the U.S., their English is, is, is pretty reasonable. So students can have some Italian and some English and be able to benefit from both, from, from, from that, that kind of language development holistically. Right. And so I'm on your website now. So it's your focus mostly on American students going abroad. So you don't have any translation on your website because you're you're really attracting no, US students. But if students. you look at SAF and we, we do we do have a Chinese website, a Japanese website, a Korean website. We will yeah, in fact one of what we just announced that we'll be allowing, you know, we'll be working with students uh, to go abroad. So we'll have a center in a center presence in a center type presence, I should say, in uh, Seoul, Korea. But we also use that same presence in Seoul, Korea to bring students from Seoul to the U.S. and other parts of the world as well. So if you look at the SAF the Study Abroad Foundation, which is part of our overall wrapper, o- o- overall business, then, then, then that is where the foreign language takes place. And a lot of that's done abroad. So when we do our websites there, we, we, we have teams in China, teams in Korea, teams in Japan that do the translation for us and, and make the websites for us. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I see the Chinese is up here. Yeah. And um, obviously that's been, you know, Asia has been disrupted through COVID, you know, to, to uh, a larger extent than, than other places, just in terms of the flow of students, just because of COVID protocols, you know, different cultures. And, but Japan and Korea are full steam ahead and China is, is working, but still have some things to work out as their as they're evolving COVID protocols dictate. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be good to have your your Japanese and Korean in in the drop down menu for navigation. Okay. So yeah, just a hint. The other thing we were talking about legal contracts earlier, Mm -hmm. and you said that you see both versions. Do you have a clause in there that says which version will prevail if there's a question about the translation? That's a great question. I'd have to think hard about it. It's been a while since I've looked at one, but I've, I've I, I'm going to defer to my legal counsel on that one. I'll leave, I'll leave it to my legal counsel to, to okay. work that out. Well, that is a suggestion that we give to attorneys I like or it. companies. Yes, just make sure you have that clarity so that Got you know okay. when you're not fighting over yeah. which one is right. That's right. Yeah, so we're, we're getting down to uh, you know the last few sure. minutes. What advice would you give going from a president to, to yeah. now heading up an international organization. What advice would you give to others that are leading an organization that are working international or thinking about working international? Well, you, you have to kind of get ready for earlier calls and later calls in the day. Although sometimes as a college president, you, you don't get the early calls, you usually get the late night calls. Those aren't so fun. But usually it's the early morning calls that you have to kind of get ready for. I would say that, you know, you really have to continue to stretch your understanding of how the world works. You know, U.S. US universities are, you know, I, I always tell people are like small religious nation states. You know when to stand, you know when to sit, you know when to sing, you know the words, all the songs, you know the great, you know, the great and the good, the people who've made the university the way it is. Um, you know, you know all the sayings. You know, it feels like the United States. It's it's the reasons why there are so many and why it's so hard to make them ever to merge because they could never imagine merging with one another. They're these unique beings. But you realize that in the world, you know, it's kind of like it's more like a federation of of, of religious nation states that you know you're dealing with. So you really have to to really expand that scope and really really think hard about the connective tissue of the organization that really makes it work. You spend a lot of time sorting out the common features and the, and the idiosyncratic features across places. And you do have to spend a lot more time thinking about what's important and what's not important in the world. Um, 
And I, I think th those are the things that I've had to really grapple with. Now, of course, I accepted the position just a week or two before the pandemic started. So I've <sighs> had a, you know, you never know what job you accept, let's say it that way. But, you know, we, I, I'm extremely fortunate that I followed an exceptional CEO who wisely built a nest egg for the organization. And we've been able to use the time even during the pandemic to become an even stronger institution still. And, but, but I, I, do, I do owe a great uh, deal to Mary for the exceptional work she did at IS Abroad before I got here. And uh, my job now is to continue to find the gas, you know, step on the accelerator as, as, as the world, uh, I would say normalizes, but uh, that's not, not quite the word. Maybe as the world uh, continues to, in its own unusual way, uh, move forward. Right, right, right. Okay, so that's really interesting about how you say it is what's the connective tissue about what goes across. You know, in talking to businesses, there that's usually the mission, the mission and the vision yeah. and the values. So is that what you're talking about? It is, you know, I mean, we, we focus really hard on on the things that that, that are the most important IS abroad. And and let me just, you know, repeat them so everybody knows. We we you know, we are the strongest academic study abroad organization out there and we emphasize our academics first and foremost. You know, at the same time, we also are the organization that is known for health and safety protocols, keeping our students safe, you know, working with students when they do hit, you know, road bumps in their health and, you know, both mental and physical. And, and we, we do just exceptional outreach to make that work. Finally, you know, diversity has, has been for a long time, you know, uh, IS Abroad has been at the vanguard of diversity and study abroad to make sure that study abroad experiences for, for students does, you know, reflect the great breadth and depth of, 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 of our country in terms of diversity. And that's an area where, we put our dollars where our mouth is. We, we do our best to make it affordable for students and you know, to, you know, to, to study abroad, to engage in that socioeconomic diversity that's out there in, in our country. So the, the, those are our three core values. Everything tends to come back to that. And that's something that we, you know, maybe I should tape it up on my wall every day. I don't know, but, but it's certainly on my sticker here on my, on my monitor. Maybe that's the next best thing as we, that's what we focus on. How do we get better at those three things each and every day? Well, you know, from we're recording this on yeah. video and you didn't even have to look down at the sticker to know yeah. what the three were. And if you get yeah. an organization that yeah. can articulate those three things, I, you know, I think you're doing a fabulous job. Mm -hmm. So, OK, I think, you know, you're, that I'm going to ask that. Mm -hmm. You've had this international experience. You hear all sorts of words. So the question is, what's your favorite foreign word? Oh, well, you know, you, you gave me a heads up on this one, and I'll have to cheat on this one, which is it's actually a phrase. And it is one of my favorite phrases. And every once in a while, I drop it on people. It's Italian. I am sure I will make a hash of it. So apologies to, to all those who love and speak Italian. But it's, it's an expression I learned when I, when I visited a buddy abroad when I was in graduate school, you know, in Milan. It was, and he taught me a couple of phrases, but one I never forgot. And one is, and, and I will make a hash of it, but it's, it's, it's co co conosco i mi polli, which is, I know my chicken, which is kind of a nice way of saying if somebody is trying to be smart, but you kind of see through them, you know, you can say, I know my chicken. And it's, you know, in any case, I, I can thank my uh, buddy from grad school, Giancarlo Perez, for, for, for dropping that on me many years ago. And, you know, every once in a while, I drop it on Italian people and they just like, oh, where the heck do you get that? So there you go. I know my check. Say it again in Italian. I'm going to try. Conosco i mi poli. I know I my check. <laughs> I, it's actually, I think, I know my chickens, but to my mind, it sounds better. I know my chickens. Uh, <laughs> well, it's funny, you know how in the United States, when we get cold, we get goosebumps. In yeah. Italian, it's called chicken skin. <laughs> oh, very good. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. I was actually somewhere when um, somebody was trying to organize an event. And, you know, my buddy said, oh, we got to go to this good go go event. And I said, you know, I want to go to this event. He says, but I bet you five bucks this person, the person who's organizing it doesn't show up. And, and I will tell you, I, I, I went a long way to this event. The person did not show up. My buddy gave me five bucks and he said, how did you know? And I said, Conosco, uh, conosco i mi poli. And he had no idea what I said. And I said, it means I know my chicken. You go Google it. That's what I said. 
I knew the person who organized it wouldn't show up. <laughs> oh, that's hysterical. There's so many there uses for that. Like there I said, go. I have a high school and senior. I got to keep those words front and center. That's right. well, <laughs> All right. How about your favorite vacation? Oh, favorite vacation. My goodness gracious. Probably two of them. I don't know. So it's hard for me to pick. Well, one was one I did with my whole family, uh, and that was to Turkey. I'd, I'd always want to go to Istanbul for the longest time in my life. I've you know, as an economist who believes in conflict, I, you know, I kind of have this, this map in my head, which is, sadly, some of the most interesting places are the ones that have been fought over, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Jerusalem, Istanbul, you know, go, just go through your list. Uh, well, if you own, look at you know. geopolitics, they're also <laughs> rich in resources. They have access to waterways. There's a lot of yes. reasons that they're fought it, over. Istan yeah. Istanbul is, it was just glorious. The layers of history, the culture, the warmth of the people. It was, it was fantastic. The other one was the Galapagos. And uh, Galapagos is actually a place where IS Abroad has a center. I'm telling you, it's not the biggest center in the world. But if you do, if you're a young person with an interest in environment, ecology, you know, marine aquatics, marine biology, et cetera, et cetera, it is a fantastic place to see um, the world and to see and, and, to, and to have a, a you know, to, to, to fill out your experience with the importance of sustainability and what care of the environment really means. One thing that we, another thing that we continue to emphasize at IS Abroad through our, through our work. So I, I would say those are, uh, those are the two. If I, if I had to pick, I, I'd have to flip a coin to decide which one was better. But one I, we did with our family, that was to Istanbul. Spent about a week to 10 days there. It was fantastic. And the second one was um, just my wife and I went to, my wife, Laura, and I went to um, uh, the Galapagos, which was fantastic for, for a week. My there mom took my son to the Galapagos and they oh. loved it. He has told me so many stories about being there. So I it's, will uh, tell him about the IES program. You know, I would tell people, uh, at least when I visit, it's, you know, it, it's, you know, you're not there to lie in a hammock. Yeah? You're there to, it, it's, it's a contact, not a contact sport, but it's a, it's a participatory sport. You are, you are in the water, on the Zodiac, in the boat. It's, it's nonstop. It's, it's fantastic. Oh, yeah, yeah. The pictures he brought back were yeah. amazing. It's actually run through our Quito Center in, in Ecuador. So it's, uh, it, but it's a great, um, it, it, it's a great program for students. Successful oh, that's fantastic. Students. We're on his list. There you go. Okay. And your memorable cross-cultural experience. Oh, my goodness gracious. Memorable cross -cultural. Oh, yeah, I, I like so I spent so you know my my background. I started my career off the Federal Reserve Board. I still hang out a little bit in central banks, you know, areas, and and I know a lot of central bankers because a, a lot of them are my vintage. A lot of them start off in the Federal Reserve um, system. But I spent a summer working at the Central Bank of Japan in Tokyo, and I had my our family came. Well, my whole family was with me for about half the time, and I was there the other half. But at one point, I had to go get my hair cut. And, you know, and you know, obviously my Japanese, I could say I can count to 10 and a few other things, but very limited. I did have a wonderful assistant who had to go with me everywhere I went for the first couple of days. But, you know, in a very unexpected way, she had to, she had to take me to go get my hair cut and had to explain. And, and this is from what I was told, it's not a place generally where women would go. But, you know, I, and, you know, for some reason, I, maybe I should have thought to have her just write down, but she had to come in with me to go get my hair cut, which was pretty funny since she was definitely the only woman in a very large place with lots of men. And I was like, oh, that was, that was something I learned then, which is uh, maybe, maybe there's got to be a better workaround or maybe I should have found a different way to do it. But it was like one of those moments, like, okay, I'm not, I'm not in the United States of America. There you go. <laughs> I don't know my chickens. <laughs> I, do not, I do not. I suppose. This, yeah. So, so that, that, that was probably the, one of the greatest cultural, like, okay, every place is a little different. Right. Go. Right. Yes. Yes. Cause you wouldn't have even anticipated to think that this. Oh, would and, and, you know, I don't know if people can see me on the podcast, but uh, just to be honest, uh, I'm not the most difficult haircut to figure out. So, um, you know, I'm like, uh, <laughs> You know, it's usually you number the clippers, one or two. It's, it's not that hard, but even getting to that point at that time in my life uh, was definitely an adventure. Oh, my gosh. That's fantastic. Now, where can people find you or reach out to you if they want to learn more? Well, you know, obviously our website, IS Abroad, is a great way to reach out to us. My, my email, probably, I don't think it'll curse me too much, is my first initial and my last name at IESabroad.org. So that's a pretty straightforward way to reach G out to me. Yes, at okay. iesabroad.org. Obviously, just contact anybody at IES Abroad and it, it'll get to me. But we're, you know, we, we have, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned kind of, kind of our, our four, 
you know, the four things we do is we do standard study abroad semester long programs. That's, that's kind of our bread and butter. We have our SAF program, which brings, so uh, IS Abroad is both the name of our umbrella organization, but also our standard business. S, the study Abroad Foundation, SAF, brings students from outside the U.S. to, to the U.S. and to other countries. That's the second line of business. The third one is internships and trying to build out opportunities for students to learn about business around the world. And the fourth one is our customized and faculty-led program. So if universities or faculty have an interest in running a program and want to kind of hand off some of the, you know, maybe they need some help in, in, in some of the courses, maybe they can handle some of the courses, not all the courses. Maybe they want us to create a program explicitly for them and handle all the courses. And if they want to do all the back office stuff, get the visas, get the housing, get the logistics all done. That's our customized and, and faculty-led programs business. All four of them are terrific and are happy to help anyone who's interested in creating life-changing experiences for their students. Okay. What was the, what's the name of the factory one? Oh, no, uh, the faculty one. So it's customized. Oh, faculty. Okay. I apologize for that. Customized and faculty-led. So sometimes, you know, oftentimes there are faculty who are interested in, you know, taking uh, classes to, well, you know, m maybe they have an interest in going to Rome and learning about the history of Rome for a couple of weeks. That's a pretty standard one. That's something we do uh, pr pr pretty regularly. That, that might be an example of that type of program, but obviously getting into the right places, having uh, somebody to teach about the history specific to the different areas, all those things are all things that we're able to do, but both in places where we have centers and places where we don't have centers. Okay. Okay. That makes a lot more sense. I heard yeah. factory and that didn't make sense. Okay. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing all this information. I mean, there's, this has just been a wealth of, of resources for people to do. And it's fun to see your academic, your banking and your, yeah. you know, now business experience all merge together. So thank you, Gregory. Hey, thanks. Thanks so much, Bonnie. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, I appreciate it. All right, everybody who listened, this has been great. You probably know some college students or, or kids that are going off to college. Send this episode off to them so they understand what the value is of doing an international exchange program. Or if you know that their parents are highly involved, send this episode to the parents to make sure that the kids go, because <laughs> that's the reality of today. So there is also a Facebook group that if you want to get on and engage with other people that are in interested in international business. It was called Global Marketing and Growth on Facebook. You just apply to get accepted and we'll accept you in. And then you can communicate with other people or even get this discussion going about who's going to do in internships. So thanks so much for listening and tune on next time. Don't forget to follow so you can get notification whenever we launch a new episode. Talk to you later. That's a wrap for this session. A big thanks to you for listening to the Global Marketing Show. Hope you had just as much fun as I did. New sessions launch weekly on all places you find podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google Play, and of course on our website. If you know someone interested in this topic, please tell them about us. Au revoir for now.